And now, Lord, as we open up your word, we ask once again that you would open up our hearts. Open up our ears, Lord. Help us to hear what you are saying to us this very day. Lord, give us manna from heaven, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, better than good morning, I have missed saying this. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 9. It seems forever ago that we've been in the Gospel of John, but we did make our way through chapter 8 before all of this craziness started. And we're going to pick up our study there this morning. So John chapter 9, verse 1 says this, And as Jesus passed by. We'll stop right there. It's significant, it really is, because it ties what we're going to look at in chapter 8, from chapter 9 back to chapter 8. If you remember in chapter 8, Jesus was there in the temple. A woman caught in the act of adultery was brought in, thrown down in front of him. And the religious leaders said that such a woman should be stoned. And Jesus has the whole kneeling down, writing in the sand. Whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. They all went away. And Jesus made a statement. He made the second of his seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. The first was, I am the bread of life, if you remember in chapter 6. And then in chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. That began a debate that stirred the religious leaders. It really set the course, driving us to the cross in our study. And at the end of chapter 8, in this debate and dialogue, Jesus says to the religious leaders, Before Abraham was, I am. And notice with me verse 59 of chapter 8. It says, Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So the passing by at the end of chapter 8 links us to the passing by in chapter 9. You would think, one would think, that people who are around you, ready to stone you, ready to take your life, you would get out of Dodge, you would leave the temple, you would seek shelter, you would find some other place to be. But as Jesus is walking away from these leaders, verse 1 tells us, and the first point of our study, the man, it says he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now my plan this morning is to make our way pretty quick through this text, just to make sure we cover everything, and then we're going to come back and with whatever time we have left and see what all the Lord might share with us from it as it pertains to us. Verse 1 again, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. He had never seen the light of day from the time of his birth. Verse 2, the mystery because of this man. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What a question. It's interesting that people look at others who are suffering, and instead of caring about their suffering, they're more concerned about some type of theological debate that might transpire because of them. We live in a day and age where people are more concerned with who caused it than who can fix it. We want to talk about who caused it when we should be talking about who fixed it. Lord, who did sin, this man or his parents? Now, John tells us that he was born blind. So at what point did this young man sin to be born 
blind. It would have had to be in his mother's womb. Jesus answers them in verse 3. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Now, he's not saying that none of these individuals had ever sinned. He's answering their specific question. It's not because of their sin that this man is in this condition, per se. He says, but that the works of God should be made manifest unto him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, now he repeats what he said in chapter 8. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. The man and the mystery. How did this come about? Why is this taking place? Who sinned? Who's to blame? Who's at fault? Instead of who can fix it? the man, the mystery, and now the miracle, because it is Jesus who can fix it. I don't know what your it is this morning, but the fixer is Jesus himself. And now we see this miracle, this amazing miracle, because of all the miracles that Jesus did that are recorded in the Gospels, healing blind eyes take place more than anything else. And he does it in different ways. Sometimes he just speaks a word and the blind see. At other times, he would place his hands upon them. At one time, he placed his hands on one man, and then he says, well, I can see, but, but men are like trees. And, and then he spoke to the man, and then he was healed. And so Jesus did things differently, and I find it interesting that we always want to put God in a box. As soon as we experience something in the Lord, we want to write a book, we want to create a seminar, and we want to travel all over the world and tell people this is how this happens. Just keep how in your mind as we make our way through this text. It says, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Ooh. He spat on the ground. So much for social distancing. And he made clay of the spittle. So he, he spit on the ground. He, he takes the spit and some clay and he begins to work it together in his hands. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He takes this clay and he rubs it into the eyes of this blind man. Now that would be offensive to some. To add insult to injury, the man is blind, and now Jesus is rubbing mud all in his eyes, but sometimes there must be irritation before illumination. Sometimes the Lord has to cause irritation before there's illumination. As I said at the beginning of the service, I believe the Lord is speaking to his church. I believe he's speaking to you. We don't come through something like this without God saying something. And we've been irritated and irritable. But if illumination doesn't come, what's it all for? And I hope and pray this morning we're all here for that very thing, illumination. So here's this man. He's blind. He doesn't even know what Jesus is doing. All of a sudden he feels something. And Jesus is rubbing mud in his eyes. And then he says to the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Can you imagine? Now this, one might say, is blind faith. He had never seen Jesus. He didn't really know what Jesus was doing. He just knows that somebody rubbed something in his eyes and told him to go wash. And so he goes to this pool, which is where the water was drawn, if you remember from our previous studies, that was poured upon the altar during the feast. He's there washing his eyes, and as he washes... He's looking down into this water and he sees his reflection for the first time. He sees what everybody else had seen when they looked at him. 
He's seen the eyes that his parents looked into when he was first born. He, he saw the light. He saw the temple. He saw other people. He saw things clearly. For the first time in all of his life, in all of his days, he could see things the way they were to be seen. He was no longer in darkness. Well, when you have a man like this and mystery surrounding the man and such a miracle takes place, well, you have to have some meetings. I mean, we, we've got to meet about this, right? And so that's what takes place. Some nosy neighbors start talking. That happened to me when I experienced this very thing. People started talking. And this is what they say, verse 8. It says, therefore, the neighbors came, therefore, and they which were before and seen him that was blind said, is not this he that sat and begged? So not only was this man born blind, he also begged. He was absolutely helpless. But at this moment, he stands there in the midst of all the chatter about him, and he's blessed. He's blessed because he's experienced this great miracle of the Lord. And some said, this is he. Others said, eh, he is like him. But he said, hey, it's me. I am he. Therefore said they unto him, here's the first time we see this word. I would challenge you to take note as we make our way through the rest of this text. How? How? How were thine eyes opened, they ask. And he answered and said, now keep in mind at this point in our study, this man has never seen Jesus ever. When he left Jesus, he was blind. It wasn't until he washed in the pool of Siloam that he received his sight. And so they say, how are thine eyes open? And he answered and he said, I love this phrase, a man that is called Jesus. A man that is called Jesus. We won't turn there for time, but in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, at the time of Jesus' birth, the angel Gabriel shows up and talks to Joseph and says, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. And in Luke chapter 1, we're told that the angel was sent to a city of Galilee, to Nazareth, to Mary, and he said, you're going to conceive in your womb, and you're going to call his name Jesus. You're going to call his name Jesus, a man called Jesus. How? How is it going to happen? How is it going to be fixed? How am I going to receive my sight? How is my marriage going to come back together? How are my children going to be saved? How am I going to make ends meet? A man called Jesus. A man called Jesus. He made clay and he anointed mine eyes and he said unto me, Go and to the pool of Siloam and wash. And he went and washed and I received my sight. And they, then they said unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. I don't, I don't know where he is. Now I understand why this man says what he says, but far too many times after we receive the gift, we lose sight of the giver. Because oftentimes the how eclipses the who. I don't know where he is, he says. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how, how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he, <laughs> he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath. <laughs> Others said, ah. How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? 
that hath opened thine eyes. He said, he, he's a prophet. He's got to be a prophet. I, all I know is his name is Jesus, but I mean, for, for this to take place, he, he's got to be a prophet. He's got to be more than just an ordinary kind of a guy. He, he's a prophet. After all, in Deuteronomy 18, Moses said, a prophet's going to come after me. And when he does, you better hear what he says. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of him that had been that had received his sight. They said, well, let's, let's call his parents. Obviously, this guy is lying. We need to gather some more witnesses and find his parents. And they asked them, saying, verse 19, is this your son who is born blind? How then? How? 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 How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son. It's like when he was before the neighbors. Hey, it's me. It's me. I'm trying to convince you it's me. And the parents are like, he's our son. He's our son. They said in verse 21, but what means how he seeth? We don't know. Or how his eyes were opened? We don't know. He's of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Whoever gets radical about Jesus, liable to be kicked out the church. Because we all know that church is not about Jesus. Church is about church. Lord, help us. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. Duh. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they unto him again, what did he do to thee? What did he do to you? There it is again, the fourth time. How opened he thine eyes? We'll come back. Oh. He answered and said, I have told you already, and, he, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? He's a little frustrated at this point. He's, he's done with all this interrogation. Can you imagine this guy? He's probably thinking, I need you to leave me alone so I can go look at some stuff, man. I got some time to catch up. All this stuff that you've seen and you've ignored and you forgot about and you just want to sit around here and debate the how. I want to enjoy what he's done for me. And if we're not careful, we'll let religious folks... We'll let church folks distract us by what's most important. And we won't enjoy the marvelous miracles that he has done in our lives as a result. We'll let them tie us all up. Verse 28, they reviled him. And they said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake to Moses, but of this fellow, we know not from whence he is. We don't know where he come from. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, for if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? This man says, you've never heard this in all of history. And you're debating about where this man came from? If this man were not of God, I love this. I love this. Because, because when you receive what Jesus Christ can do in your life and has done in your life, you stop being afraid of what folks think and what folks say. 
I mean, here's a guy who's been blind his whole life. He'd never seen the temple. He had never seen a priest. He had never seen a Pharisee. He had never seen any of the stuff that all these individuals, he had never seen a scroll or read the Torah. He had never in his life known anything. And now, here's what he knows. This is all he's got to know. Some of you are like, well, I don't know if I can witness to people because I really don't know what to say. A man called Jesus, he opened my eyes and he caused me to see. And now he is lecturing, if you will. He is teaching the teachers. I love it. He says, if this man were not of God, verse 33, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin. Don't you love that? The moment people start losing the debate, they go to name calling. There's a lot of that going on today. He says, You're born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Now, don't you dare for one moment think, Oh, poor fella. Don't you dare. Because it's the best thing that ever happened to him. They kicked him out. They kicked him out of a place that Jesus wasn't wanted. Now I'm going to tell you this morning, I don't care how pretty the building is. I don't care how big it is. I don't care who's speaking in it. If Jesus ain't there, I ain't interested. I'm not interested. Out. <laughs> Wow. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, how did Jesus find this guy? I just heard somebody whisper the answer. He's Jesus. <laughs> He has a special way of finding us, doesn't he? Because he's a shining light. I'm the light of the world. He's a seeking light. He will seek us out. And he's a saving light. He finds this man. And he says unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Oh, I'm going to shout at verse 36. He answered and said, What did he say? He answered and said, how? Nope. He answered and said, who? If for nothing else God sent me this morning to tell you to stop thinking about the how and focus on the who. Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Who is he? Who is he? And Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that they which see might not see, and that they which see might be made blind. Wait a minute. For judgment I am coming to this world. I think I read that wrong, just in case. They which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. Now let's have some fun, shall we? Right? Let's, let's go back and, and, and dig a little bit deeper into some of this stuff. This is an amazing account in the scripture. Now the message. Right? We've looked at the man, the mystery, the miracle, the meetings. Now the message. Why this? If, if you'll remember from our introduction in John chapter 20, we won't turn there, but John says that many things Jesus did. He did all kinds of miracles he says, but these are written, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you might have life in his name. John says, I wrote these specific down, seven signs, 
seven I am's. He said, I specifically picked these out, different than the other gospel writers, not so much a, a full account of what took place, but specific accounts so that you could see Jesus for who he really is and not just see him, but believe. And when you believe, you will have life everlasting or eternal. Back to the man. The man was born blind. Can you imagine? Trick question. Can you imagine being born into darkness? Being born in absolute darkness. Being born blind. You were not physically like this man per se, but spiritually. You were born into sin. This whole thing pictures the fall. It pictures the fall, which is so interesting. We don't have time. I'm on a little time crunch now that we've got two services. I've threatened that we're going to let loose on the second one because we don't have nothing happening <laughs> after. But we'll see. We'll see. Pray for me. Pray for them. <laughs> In the beginning, God created man in his own image. He created that man. And there at the fall, Satan talking to Eve. Eve partook of the fruit. She gave it to her husband. They both ate of that fruit. And the Bible says something interesting. The Bible says, and the moment that they ate of it, listen, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. And they realized they were naked. They were exposed. They were uncovered. Many scholars believe that Adam and Eve were clothed in this beam of light, the kabod, the glory of Almighty God. In Psalm 104, the psalmist says that God himself is wrapped in light like a garment. In Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that he did shine forth like the sun and his raiment shone. It was shining, this idea of God's light, God's glory being wrapped around them. And the moment they sinned, the moment they fell, the moment they died spiritually, their eyes were opened. They realized they were naked. In darkness, this man was born blind. You and I were born blind. We were born in sin for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. He was born blind. Now the mystery, the mystery is, well, well who sinned? Surely sin has some kind of connection to this whole thing. And it does. It does. Now, in the account, Jesus says it wasn't because of sin that this guy was born blind because he was going to be an object to reveal God's glory and God's work. But sin did have an impact on us as it pertains to spiritual darkness. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 51, David says, In sin was I conceived. In my mother's womb, I, I was born in to sin. I was born in darkness. I was born blind. And not only was I born in sin because of the fall, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul says this, that the God of this world, Satan, the devil, has blinded the eyes of men. It's a very sad thing <laughs> when that takes place. It really is. And in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, but I fear lest somehow, as the serpent beguiled Eve, that, that you would be beguiled from the simplicity, the singleness, the sight of Christ. There is a darkness that pervades on this planet. There is a darkness because of sin that men are born into. And this man is a picture. He's a sign, a symbol of what that is. And then Jesus, during that mystery, he says, I was, I was sent, in verse 4, to do those works that the Father told me to do. Uh, we'll get to the how, but, but we focus on the works, don't we? We focus on what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Can I remind you this morning, Jesus does the work. 
He does the work, Philippians 2, 13, for it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He says, I must do the work of him, verse four, this is important, that sent me. That sent me. He says it over again in verse, where is it here? Well, I'm not going to waste time trying to find it, but it's, it's later on in the chapter. He says the same thing. He says it in chapter 8. The Father sent me. I am the one that was sent. Now, this is important. It's pertinent. Because remember, Jesus comes to this man. And the first thing we see him do is spit on the ground. Now, that would have offended many people. And he reaches down with that spit and he begins to make clay. And that takes me all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. This is not a restorative miracle. This is a creative miracle. Jesus is not restoring something that was lost. He is creating something that wasn't. And just like we see in Genesis chapter 2, where God forms Adam by the dust of the earth, He's making clay with spittle, spittle and clay. From dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return, spittle. In Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verse 26, the Lord says, he says, spittle. It comes forth from his mouth. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And then in chapter 2, I believe it's verse 7, he forms man. So we have spittle and clay. We looked at the man that's born blind, a picture of the fall. Now I believe this is picturing, signifying, helping us to get this picture of the flesh. Because that's what we were made of, clay, dust. And Jesus takes this clay and he takes this spittle and he anoints the eyes of this man. And he says to this man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam, remember, John says, means scent. Now, many Bible teachers take this idea of sin and try to apply it to us. That means we're supposed to be sin and God has sent us like he sent the blind man and that's fine, that's good, have your way if you will. But I don't believe it's talking about us. I believe sent is referring to the one that was sent, which is Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, the light of the world. Go wash away the clay. Go wash away that which is over your eyes. This creative work, whereby Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. I remember when Jesus found me, I was washed by the water of his word, Ephesians 5, as I heard the gospel. I was washed by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, as Titus tells us. And I was washed by his precious blood. And I'll never forget that night. I passed from darkness into light. I could see. And I could see clearly and it's not because the rain was gone, as the singer says. Some of you are like, what? It works. Trust me. You're all back now. I could see clear because it was washed away. I was washed. I was cleansed. I was clean. And then the meetings... You know, the world is full of meetings, isn't it? In the White House, the courthouse, the schoolhouse, the church house. And they all get together and they discuss how. 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 How, and like this blind man, I'm sick of how. Anybody else sick of how? I mean, we're going, no, no, not, let me take that back. They're going to debate endlessly on the how. I'm not. 
I'm going to focus on the who. I'm going to focus on the one who opened my eyes and allowed me to see. I'm not in darkness anymore. And I hope you're not in darkness anymore. Jesus asked him, do you believe on the Son of God? And he says, who is he, Lord? In Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Paul is discussing this frustration that he finds within himself when he's trying to be a religious man. He's trying to have moral character. He's, he's trying to do the right thing and be what he should be. And he says, the things that I don't want to do are the very things that I find myself doing. And the things that I want to do, well, I don't do. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. And he says this. How am I going to fix this problem that I've got? No, he doesn't. He says, who? Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And then he answers the question, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. There's two types of people in this world. Only two. This morning, you're in one of those camps. You're either in that group of people who say this, are we blind also? Or the one that says, I was blind, but now I see. Now the first camp, are we blind also? They're the ones that want to throw stones and revile and ridicule and debate endlessly on the hows. Even though, even if you could articulate specifically how the creator of the universe, incarnation, God in flesh, stood with clay and spittle and created eyes in a man that had no sight. If somehow you could put that into their language and communicate it to their educated minds, they still would not understand. Like, let there be light? Really? How, how, how do you understand that? Scientists are now saying that light is everywhere in every square inch of the universe. They estimate there's some four billion photons in every square meter. And John says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And James says, he's the father of lights, which every good and perfect gift comes from. How are we blind also? Who? I was blind, but now I see. I believe, Lord. And this man fell down and worshipped him worshipped him. He became a light himself. And Jesus says, we're to be lights. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. We're to be lights. In Philippians, he says, we shine as lights in a crooked and perverse nation. And so some Christians are, are talking about the who. They're caught up in the debate and they're saying, and I'm almost done. They're saying, how, how, how can we fix this? And how can we fix that? And how can this happen? Those who say who, they're worshiping. They're worshiping. And they're shining. They're shining the light of the world. So I don't know what camp you're in this morning. If you're in the, are we blind also? I say to you, go wash. Go wash. Go wash and you will come back seeing. If you're in the camp that says, I was blind, but now I see, I say to you two things. Number one, worship. And number two, witness. Because the darker it gets out there, the brighter the light shines. Amen? I once was blind. But now, I see. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word today. Lord, you are the light of the world. 
and we thank you for that. I was in darkness once, and I thank you for that day that I saw the light. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would not forget that there are countless people who, apart from your grace, will spend eternity in what you call outer darkness. Forgive us, Lord, and help us for all the times that we sat around debating the how and pointing fingers and wanting to know who sinned, this man or those, instead of pointing to the Savior who can work the miracle of salvation and give sight to the blind. Lord, you've given us this gospel account for us to see who you are. Give us faith today. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Help us, Lord. Let faith arise in our hearts that we believe squarely and solely upon you, the light of the world this day. And empower us by your spirit and enable us to go forth from this gathering today in a dark and dying world and shine forth your light. In Jesus' name, amen.